at the very beginning, I, I want to uh, greet you again at lecture six from uh, Structural Bi Biology Methods. Uh, mainly, we will focus on cryo microscopy as we focused on it uh, the last lecture, uh, lecture five. Now we will uh, focus more on spatial wave Fourier transfer image formation and contrast transfer function. <coughs> Let's begin with a spatial wave. What is spatial wave? All of you know a wave uh, that uh, oscillates in time up and down is sine wave. It starts in zero and uh, then uh, going to its maximum, the minimum maximum over some uh, zero points. We can uh, uh, describe this function as uh, so y as a function of uh, the space and the time as an amplitude of that function times sine and uh, here we have a, a kx, the k we will define here. Uh, what k is, k we will define as spatial frequency. Spatial frequency, we will define the easiest as 2 pi uh, uh, over lambda, where lambda is the wavelength and 2 pi is a period. So whereas we are uh, going from 0 to 2 pi, we are passing a one full wavelength of our wave. Now, uh, let's assume that uh, we freeze this uh, uh, wave in time zero. This way, what you can see here is frozen time zero. It's not propagating anywhere. It's just standing in the right place. Therefore, we can omit uh, this part uh, of our uh, descriptor. And what we will end up uh, will be a much more simpler equation where the function, what we have can see here, is actually an amplitude times sine of uh, k times x, because we uh, already know that this term here, 2 pi lambda, we have it uh, here described, is actually k, k times x, plus some phase shift. On the image here, we see zero phase shift. So this is a true sine wave with a phase shift equals to zero. We can see here as well, that when x approaches zero, uh, then uh, that uh, the period uh, starts at zero point. Whereas if x, x approaches, we are going from here to here, and this is the wavelength, x is at the wavelength, we are at the full period uh, of the spatial wave. Let's take a look at some of the spatial waves that I just prepared for you. Here are many spatial waves. Uh, all the waves are oscillating up and down, and we can see that the very first wave, we can choose an interval from zero to two pi, which will fully describe this wave, because all the rest of the wave is just repetition of this first interval from zero to two pi, from the first period of the wave. This wave is described as one time sine one x plus zero. Whereas we can see that the one here implies the amplitude and uh, k times x uh, is the spatial frequency. Here we have a number one. So the spatial frequency for this sine wave is number one. Well, actually this number one will uh, mean for us that in the period of zero to two pi, we will have only one oscillation. We will have only one wavelength of, uh, uh, of this sine wave. So, uh, if we go further, we can see that uh, we, we can describe another wave where we change the amplitude and we will have a bigger wave which, which will have an amplitude of two, but still in, uh, in the range of zero to two pi, we will have only one oscillation, one up and down on the sine wave. So uh, the sine wave appears only in, in, the, uh, in the interval of zero to two pi only once. What will happen when we increase the k to 2. Actually, what happens is that if we increase the spatial frequency of this wave in one interval from 0 to 2 pi, we will have two oscillations of the wave. And then it will start over and over. But actually, uh, when we increased the spatial frequency, that means that we are increasing the frequency of the wave that many times we will fit the wavelength into the interval of 0 to 2 pi as many times uh, we increase the k. You can see it from the equation, <coughs> I'm sorry, that if k will equal to 2 and we define k as 2 pi over lambda, then we can uh, uh, get out the lambda from this expression and see that actually the wavelength 
of this k2 wave will be the pi and you can see that if we take a, here is the pi which actually crosses uh, our wave here and we can see that the first wavelength actually passes through the pi and then another wavelength starts in the range of 0 to 2 pi if we would increase this to k4 then uh, this would end up in uh, pi, half, pi half and pi half actually would mean that uh, our wave would oscillate much faster and actual, actually what we would have is that the first wavelength of this spatial wave would cross uh, our uh, period from 0 to 2 pi at pi half here is somewhere pi half Now, uh, let's take up this. Now, uh, what we can do as well, we can introduce a phase shift. The phase shift, uh, we can express phase shift in degrees in radians. This is the uh, expression in radians, whereas uh, pi half radi in radians is a 90 degree phase shift. And we can see that actually our sine wave turned into a cosine wave where it starts from maximum, goes down to the minimum, but actually, because this is a 2, pi, uh, two uh, k wave, uh, after two oscillations, it ends up at 2 pi period at the maximum where it began. And then it starts over and over, and we have, uh, again, uh, the same wave uh, over the whole space. The last thing uh, I want to show you that actually to this sine wave, we can add a constant. So we add a constant of 1 to all the sine wave that has an amplitude 1, and uh, a k1 in this case. This wave uh, essentially is the same as the very first wave that we showed up here. Nevertheless, if you take a look on the y-axis, you will see that it oscillates not from minus uh, one to one, but it oscillates from zero to two. Because actually to every single point of this sine wave, we are adding one. So when it starts in zero, Actually, this point will be, uh, uh, for this wave, a uh, starting point of 1. When it reaches the minimum, which is minus 1, we add 1, this will be actually the 0 point. This is what you can see here. So, the way uh, I showed you uh, this expression here, up here, we can describe spatial waves uh, which have three parameters. Uh, one parameter is the amplitude of the wave, how big the wave actually is. Second parameter is a spatial frequency. The spatial frequency is, in fact, how many times during the period uh, uh, the wavelength of our uh, wave passes. And then there's a phase shift that we can shift our wave uh, to the left or to the right uh, from the zero starting point to actually uh, describe the wave that we want to have. Now, uh, on the following slide, I want to show you that actually what we can do with waves is addition or summation of waves. Let's have a wave uh, K1 of an amplitude 1 and phase 1. Uh, i shown two wavelengths of this wave, but actually the period of 2 pi ends here, here is a 0, and therefore this is a K1 wave. That's another wave. The second wave will be a K2 wave. You can see there are two oscillations of this wave. And this wave will have a lower amplitude, A2, as well. It will have some phase. In this case, the phase is zero, the same as the phase for A1. Let's take another wave that will be the wave K3. For wave K3, we can see that actually it has a larger amplitude that uh, wave K2 had, but uh, uh, it oscillates over the period of uh, 0 to 2 pi three times, one, two, three times. It's a K3 wave. Now what we want to do is we want to add up all these waves into a new wave. So let's take a point from, uh, from a space. Let's take some, some point x1. And let's take a look what's the value of the waves at this point x1. The first wave will have a value quite high. The second wave at this point will have a, uh, a value of zero, sorry, and the third wave will be actually negative in this way. If we add up all of these components, we will find that it will be a little bit, this amplitude, the final amplitude will be lower 
than the amplitude of the first wave because uh, the third wave actually subtracted from this amplitude, whereas the second wave doesn't affect it at all. Let's take another position, a position of x2, let's say. At position of x2, our wave number one is starting to decrease, and we have a lower amplitude. However, for the, uh, for the wave two, we see that we passed from zero to a negative value, and for the wave three, we are actually here in the positive value. If we add up all these lines, we will get a, another line that will represent the sum of these amplitudes. This is a very special case. Uh, this is a case where all three waves has a zero point. So when we're adding up zeros, we end up in zeros as well. This is nothing new. And let's take one more thing that, uh, one more space, uh, one more spatial coefficient, uh, where we will have a negative value for the, uh, for the wave one and positive value for the wave two and the positive value for wave three. Still, if we add up all these values of the uh, amplitude, we will end up in a slightly negative value. Now, we can do this for all the distance from, from here, here all over. All over here, we can add up all the values, and we will know that this will uh, repeat all the time for the rest of the wave. We can, we can go out of the screen for uh, the wave because it will uh, indefinitely repeat itself and uh, it will al always repeat all the pattern. So what we will end up will be the sum of these three waves. The sum of these three waves looks a little bit strange for us. However, something we can see right out from it. We can see that this wave actually starts to repeat exactly with the same period as the very first wave was repeating. And that in certain part of this first wave, we subtracted amplitudes. In certain part, we added amplitudes. We see that here it would be lower than actually it is. And thus, this third wave is a, is a sum of all these three waves. This is quite easy to understand. Now, we are interested in whether if we have this wave, and we don't know from which waves it's actually built up, if we can decompose this wave into uh, a certain, um, certain number of sine waves. Let's see. I a little bit modified uh, this wave. If you take a look uh, at the previous slide, the wave was passing through the x-axis in the middle of the wave. Now I uh, pushed a little bit higher the wave so that uh, the zero value is here of the y-axis and this wave has always positive values. Let's represent this wave as a kind of electron density through the space, which will never be negative, it will be always positive. Uh, so when we want to describe this wave, <coughs> the first component that's already always in the image or always in the wave that we want to describe is a so-called DC component. This is a constant function, this is a function that has uh, all the numbers, all, all the values for the y are constant during entire x. So it doesn't matter what the x1, x2, x3, x4 is, the value of this wave or, or of this function is always constant. What this DC component represents actually is the mean value of this wave. So we know that the mean value of the wave is somewhere here so this distance will be actually the DC component of our decomposition. This is why I wanted to show you uh, on a wave that is seated on a, is sitting actually on a on the x-axis, so it's pushed higher because actually if we would take the wave from the previous example, that wave was oscillating from minus one to plus one, let's say. And the DC component of this wave would be certainly zero, because the mean of this wave would be e exactly uh, in the point of zero on the y-axis. Nevertheless, in this case, we have a DC component. Then what we can do is to take the first wave that will have the K1, whereas we will find that the period of zero to two pi starts and ends here, 
because from this point our wave starts to repeat. So what we've seen here is actually repeating here, and that would repeat end up here, here, and here. So we will take a K1 wave. We will take a K1 wave, and we will try to find a wave that will most likely describe by the amplitude uh, this wave. Then when we have a first wave, what we call fundamental frequency, K1, then we add another wave. The other wave will have a frequency of K2. This K2 frequency we actually call as the first harmonics. The first harmonics of this uh, uh, wave will have actually the double of oscillations of the fundamental spatial frequency. Uh, and then we can add a, a K3, that will which will call the second harmonics. And when we sum up all these three waves, plus the DC component, we should end up with a wave that we draw up here. Now, uh, there's, there are some troublesome functions that it's very hard to, uh, to describe using this way. The first was a constant function. The constant function, uh, the DC function, or, or the DC component of the wave we already described, is a function that has everywhere a constant value. When we try to approximate this constant function with a sine wave, we find out that actually this is very hard to do. So we will try uh, to approximate it to a larger sine wave. We are getting closer, but still we can see that here we are undershooting and here we are overshooting our, our constant function. So we will increase the wavelength of this uh, wave and we will get closer and closer. And I can say that uh, when we will go to infinite wavelength, an infinite large wavelength, then we know that for the infinite wavelength, the K will approach zero. And from the equation, what we have, that zero times k is actually uh, is actual one that we get the amplitude of this DC component. This is the amplitude of the DC component. Now let's take another wave. This wave is a square wave. To describe square wave is even harder. The reason for that is that the sine waves are smooth. So let's start uh, we see that uh, our square wave is actually sitting on zero. Therefore, uh, we can see that there's an equal amount of values over the zero and under the zero. Therefore, the DC component of this wave will be actually zero. We can start to add up waves that uh, will be uh, the fundamental frequency K1 and K2, K3 uh, waves. What we will find with the K1 wave, this actual wave that has one oscillation over the period, that this wave somewhere underestimates, in this part it underestimates, and here it overestimates the square function. This is because the sine wave is simply a very smooth wave. Now, uh, there are some mathematical proofs that we can start to add uh, the second wave, the K2 wave, However, when we add the, second, uh, the K2 wave, we will uh, end up that the most appropriate wave for this will be the wave that has, in fact, an amplitude of zero. So with the next wave that we will add will be a wave that will have three oscillations over the period. So you can see one, two, three oscillations, K3 wave. Now for a K3 wave, we see that for certain range, it will add up, so it will add up here, but in other parts, somewhere here, it will cut it down. So somewhere it will add, somewhere it will subtract. This will be the same for the other, uh, other part of the image or, or the function as well. And it will make something like this. This is getting closer to square wave, but still what we have here, we are missing some part. Here are overshoots, undershoots, overshoots, and a missing part. And again, we know that every even uh, k will have approximately amplitude of zero. Nevertheless, if we add another odd key, so an odd spatial frequency, then we will have a wave that will have five uh, oscillations over the period. And this wave will again add a little bit uh, in some regions of this wave, 
because we are adding all the three waves here. So actually we can first add these two waves and to the result of, of this wave we can add the third wave. Uh, somewhere we will add a little bit, somewhere we will subtract a little bit, and what we will end up is a wave that will have even more oscillations at the very top uh, of the square wave, but it still will have problems with approximation of the edges of the square wave. This is because the sine wave is simply a smooth wave, and what we want to do is to approximate a very steep wave, a very sharp wave, uh, that actually the square wave is. But you can see that the more components we are adding up, the more close we get to the square wave. And this is to show you that if you have a very sharp feature in your uh, function, then for this sharp feature uh, you need to uh, describe this feature using very high frequencies, so it's summing up waves with high frequencies, up to very high frequencies. So, uh, this is an uh, animation from Wikipedia where you're adding up these uh, odd k numbered waves, and you can see the more and more you are adding up, the finer, the flatter the top and the bottom part will become. However, always we will have a little bit of overshoots and undershoots at the very edges of this wave. So this is the best approximation what we can do with a sine wave which is naturally smoothly curved and this is a steep step function. Now uh, so far we were only talking about that we will try to find a wave that fits the most. We will try to find a k1 wave that fits the most this wave then we will try to find another wave a k2 wave that will uh, fit the most our waves. So uh, this way we were able to decompose our uh, our complex wave. However, we need a universal solution how to find out the amplitudes and the phases of the waves that we are adding up. This is called Fourier decomposition or Fourier transformation. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier uh, made a mathematical proof that where he described that every periodical function, this can be a very complex function, can be decomposed into sum of infinite number of sine waves, of very simple sine waves. And what he ended up is the Fourier transform, which is a very nice function, uh, however it's a little bit hard to understand when we take first look on it, we will try to describe it more to, to make it better understandable. However, because we have Fourier transform, there is another, uh, an inverse operation that's called inverse Fourier transform. So what Fourier transform does is that uh, in this case, uh, this is a time dependent wave, this is not a spatial wave uh, in this description, so you have function of time and you are transforming a function of time into a series uh, of uh, waves that will actually uh, depend on the frequency of the wave. Because the omega, we can describe as two pi frequencies, so the omega is uh, proportional uh, to the frequency. So we get from a function that depends on time, we will get self, self functions that depends on frequency. Now, this e, e, e uh, uh, x powered uh, to i times omega t, we can describe, uh, you know it from lecture, I guess, two, one or two, that actually this expression can be written as well as an expression of a times cosinus alpha plus i times sinus alpha, where in this case the alpha is the omega t, t omega time, and therefore this component, this part, we can decompose as a, as a sum of a cosine wave and a sine wave. Whereas the cosine wave is a real space, a uh, sine wave is an imaginary space. You already heard about this uh, in the previous lecture. So what Fourier said that uh, if we take our function, this is the function that we want to decompose, then for every uh, frequency 
we can find Fourier component of this function. We only need to integrate this function from from a minus infinite to plus infinite over all the function and multiply the function by the function that we are interested in. So if we are interested in a k1 function, then actually this, this part will describe a k1 function. If you are interested in a k2 function, then this part will describe a k2 function and the integral over this will tell us what will be the amplitude and phase of that certain function. As well as if we have a Fourier representation of, uh, of our function, we do an inverse Fourier transform and we can get back to our original function. Now for spatial waves, uh, we can uh, rewrite all these equations uh, to this very simple form where we, uh, we can state that our complex function is actually a sum of a phase uh, of a, an amplitude zero, this we call the DC component, plus sum of sine and cosine waves that will have uh, that that will uh, range from m equals to one to m equals to infinite. So actually, what you see here that this part we define as k. So uh, actually, we, when we start with m one times k then m two times k, three times k. So actually what m does is it's going all over the spatial frequencies. So it goes to, from spatial frequency one, two, three, four, five, and it starts to add a, a cosine wave where uh, 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 with a sum of another sine wave. This uh, representation uh, of the summation of the wave actually uh, is a kind of representation where we are not using phases to describe the waves. Uh, however, we are using a, a cosine and a sine component of the wave. Down here in argon diagram, where you here you have the uh, real and here you have the imaginary part, you can see that a wave, wave this green one, we can describe as an amplitude of this green arrow plus here is some psi the psi will be uh, the phase uh, of, of this wave or we can also describe it as two components as a cosine component and a sine component and what we will end up that when we uh, take an amplitude of sine component and an amplitude of cosine component, then actually it describes a wave that represents a sine wave with some phase shift. This is just to show you that uh, actually adding sine and cosine waves of the same frequency is making a new wave, uh, uh, is making a wave that we can represent as a sine wave with some phase shift. Now for these amplitudes that we are adding up amplitudes, or adding up waves with, with a certain k number and the amplitude of that k number, uh, we can describe this amplitude by the Fourier decomposition that now we are not uh, integrating from, uh, uh, from minus infinity to plus infinity, but we are integrating in space. And we know that uh, if we integrate it from zero to, to lambda, then we already covered one full oscillation uh, of the wave and actually this will just repeat over and over. So for this reason it's enough for us to integrate from zero to wavelength. Now again uh, this is very similar what we have previously that we have the original function that we want to decompose times the the function that we are interested in to decompose so now we want to decompose it in the series of cosine and sine waves of a certain frequency of frequency m. So the amplitude of a uh, uh, frequency, let's say k1, where m will be 1, will be uh, calculated by, uh, by, uh, by an equation where this will be a 1. This is the mathematics uh, behind the Fourier space. It's a little bit complicated, but uh, nevertheless, the, the most important thing that you will need to take away, to take home, is that in every complex function, every complex wave function, we can decompose into very simple waves, and the most simple wave that uh, we can describe is a sine wave. 
So uh, every complex function we can decompose into a series or, or uh, uh, further into an infinite series of sine waves with a certain amplitude and phase. Now, we will need somehow to store the Fourier transform. How we can store it? First of all, we can store uh, a Fourier transform as wave vectors. What wave vector is, is very similar that I showed you uh, at the previous slide, that we have a vector f, I'm sorry, vector f, which represents the uh, direction and the size of the amplitude. So the size of the vector f actually is the amplitude. The direction of vector f is defined by, uh, by this angle alpha, which is actually the phase angle. Now one way how we can represent the Fourier transform of a complex function will be a series of, uh, of amplitudes and phases at a certain frequency. So we will take a frequency of k1 and we will have uh, a set of amplitudes and phases uh, for uh, one, sorry, uh, one amplitude and one phase for the k1. Then we take a k2, we will have one amplitude and one phase for the k2, and so on, and we can go to, to infinite, to k equals to infinite. However, there's another way how we can describe waves. This is, again, something from lecture 2 that you already described, that we can describe a wave as amplitude times cosinus alpha plus i sinus times alpha. Uh, this cosinus sinus is the very same that I described previously on the previous slide, that actually in this way we don't work with a phase here, uh, or amplitude and phase. We are here working with the real part of the wave and the imaginary part of the wave. Or let's say a real amplitude and the imaginary amplitude of the wave. And this is a complex number. And the good thing about complex numbers is that the mathematics beyond the complex numbers is very easy. Here you can see how the addition and how a multiplication of a complex uh, number works. And this is uh, very beneficial, for example, for computer sciences that you can store wave like uh, an array of values of the real part and an array of values of the imaginary part. And then when you try to add, subtract or multiply the waves, there's a very easy mathematical apparatus behind how to do that. Now, for us to represent a wave in Fourier space, and the Fourier space we also call a reciprocal space. The reciprocal space and the uh, real space are linked together by Fourier transformation. So if you take a wave in real space and we make a Fourier transformation of this wave, we get a Fourier transform of this, uh, we, we get Fourier transform in reciprocal space. And reciprocal space, uh, it's a kind of easiest way how to, how to show how a Fourier transform of a wave looks is a power spectra. A power spectra actually is a plot where we have on the x-axis the k value and on the y-axis we have the intensity, which the intensity actually equals to the square of the amplitude. Now, let's take our first wave that we have at the very beginning of our lecture. Uh, this wave has an amplitude of 1 and a k-value of 1. So we can plot in the Fourier space that actually this wave is composed only of single component. This wave is composed of a single component that has an amplitude of 1. Here is 1. And a k-value of 1. Now, for spatial waves, we can never be sure whether the wave was traveling this direction or that direction before we stop the wave. Because uh, in any case, we can describe the same wave with the same properties. Therefore, in the Fourier space, we will have an additional uh, line or additional value at the minus k value. 
So for this wave, it fits equation well the Fourier transform of, of 1 amplitude 1 as the mi k minus 1 amplitude uh, 1. You see that the power spectra is symmetrical. Now let's go further on, let's take a look on a 2 sine uh, one, uh, 1 k wave. This will have an amplitude of 2 and the k number of 1. Again, on the x-axis we plot the k1 and on the y-axis we will plot a double as big uh, line or value where we actually here will be 2. Uh, if we uh, square it, it will be actually 4 because the amplitude was 2 and the, uh, and the square of the amplitude will be 4. Nevertheless, we see that the only difference uh, in between the first and the second power spectrum is the size uh, of the amplitude at a certain point. And this is very true. We have two very similar waves that have the same oscillation. The only thing that differs in these waves is the amplitude of the wave. Now, this representation uh, in, uh, in Fourier space actually is exactly the same thing that we have in the real space. So if I take uh, a plot in the Fourier space and make an inverse transform of this, uh, of this power spectra into the waves, what we, we, uh, I will get will be the wave in the real space. So a Fourier space actually is nothing else, just a different representation of the wave uh, from the real space represented in uh, the wave in the reciprocal space. And for a K2 wave, you can see that we have two, uh, we have uh, uh, um, plotted points at k point uh, at the point k two, and here where we have also a DC component, we have a, a zero plus sine. So here we have one. We actually have uh, another component at a uh, point of zero. It's, I think it's very understandable. It's easy how the power spectra work. The power spectra, however, shows you only the amplitude of the sine wave. And the problem with these power spectra is that uh, some people forget about that behind every amplitude there is a phase. So for, for a wave that has a k value of 1, we have an amplitude of 1, but there's a phase of this as well. In this case, it's phase zero, but we had a wave where phase was different, and you see that in the power spectrum, we don't see the phases. The, uh, plotting out the phases would be a little bit messy, and it would, would not give you uh, that many information at the first sight as you get from the power spectra. Nevertheless, the thing that you need to be aware of that the Fourier space, the reciprocal space, does not contain only of a power spectra, does not contain only amplitudes, it contains phases as well. Now let's go back to our complex wave. Let's take a look how this would look like in uh, the Fourier space. We know that this complex wave actually builds off of these three waves, k1, k2 and k3, with a certain amplitudes and certain phases. Again, uh, we are quite lucky that these phases are almost zero here. It's a little bit there's a phase shift in that for, for the uh, wave K1. Now, uh, we as well have uh, a default, uh, uh, a constant amplitude uh, of A0. That's something that's shifting up your wave. Actually, I need to push this uh, line a little lower to, to make it consistent with the previous slide. Nevertheless, we can plot out that A0 has an amplitude of this size, then a K K1 wave has an amplitude of this size because this is the biggest amplitude that we have all over here. And because uh, our power spectrum is symmetrical, then we will plot at the minus K minus one as well, the same amplitude. For K2, we have a quite small amplitude. This will represent this small line here. And for K3, we have a little larger amplitude, but this amplitude is still uh, a little bit smaller than the amplitude of K1. From this power spectra, you can readily see that our complex wave consists of four waves. 
one wave is the DC component, this is more like a constant function than a wave. Then we have a K1 wave, K2 wave, K3 wave, and we can see how much these waves actually contributes to the result of, uh, of the summation. Still, don't forget out that we are not only, uh, when we are summing up a wave, we are not only taking the amplitudes, we are not only adding up the amplitudes, we are also shifting this amplitude by the phase shift. So a large amplitude not necessarily means that, that the overall, in overall we will have the addition of, three, of these three lines. And let's take a look in reciprocal space on a step function. On a step function, we uh, talked about that the step function actually has uh, is, is composed of waves that have an odd number of uh, k values. And what you can see here, here's the odd number that for uh, k value 1, we actually have quite high amplitude, whereas for k, uh, k value 2, it's a significantly lower, in fact, 0. For k value 3, we have a higher amplitude, but still lower than 1 ones, and so on, and so on. What you can see here that we are plotting out uh, certain k values uh, when we are talking about infinite, infinite number of, uh, of waves, we can represent this as a, as a continuous function. The power spectrum we can uh, represent as continuous function uh, uh, of this, for example, step function. Now, in the microscopy and many other methods that do discret discretization of the measured uh, values, uh, something happens that uh, we need to describe on this slide. Uh, what is a discrete wave? Up here, we start with a, wa with a sine wave. We will have a sine wave that goes up and down and again up. And this sine wave actually has one, uh, one wavelength plotted out here. Now we have a detector. Let's have we have a detector that has only one, dimen one dimension. It will have only one pixel, and uh, in a in a strip we will have 16, 16 pixels. So it's a one times 16 uh, detector. Now when we try to detect, what are the actual values uh, of the sine function? <coughs> we will end up that a certain pixel can measure only just a, a small part of this function. So this pixel will detect this part of the function, this pixel will detect this part of the function, this pixel will detect this part of the function. Uh, even uh, to be more uh, precise, this pixel actually detects the integral of this part of the function. This is the intensity, what it, will, uh, what it will detect. Nevertheless, it will detect only a single value. So while our sine function is going continuously from 0 to 1 and 1 to 0 and, uh, and from 0 to minus 1 and from minus 1 to 0, in an infinite fine steps, when discretization happens, we will actually slice up our sine wave into a certain amount of values, and this is a discretization of the wave. Now we will see that for this step we will have maybe a value of 0 0.3, 0 0.6, 0 0.9, then we will go back, uh, we will reach the top of 1, and then again 0 0.9, 0 0.6, 0 0.3, and so on, and we will go to negative 0 0.3, and so on, and so on. And so on. So, uh, when we do a Fourier transform of a, of a discrete function, uh, we will end up with something like this. We will end up with Fourier components that will have that many components, this is one Fourier component, that is the half of the samples plus the DC component. So, we know that this one is the DC component for our wave that actually is passing through the x-axis. In this case, the DC component will be zero. And then uh, we can take a look for a component uh, of uh, K1, K equals to one, then K equals to two, 
and so on and so on. Okay, so two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And there are no more. The eight is the last one. So the Fourier component for discrete function that has 16 samples, actually, the Fourier component of A8 and the phase fate, the A is amplitude, and the phi, uh, f this is the phi, the phase, the P is the phase uh, of our uh, Fourier component. And actually, we'll find <coughs> that there are no more components than uh, uh, this eight component or the number of samples divided by two. And this is what we call the Nyquist component. Why is it so? The problem is that uh, if we have a discrete function, actually the, uh, the wave that we can describe, the finest wave, the wave with the highest frequency, will be the wave that will have an oscillation uh, in, in between uh, it's a little hard, hard to uh, hard to show, but actually, what I wanted to uh, show you that uh, the wave, the most fine wave that we can have here, will have a maximum in this pixel, maximum in this pixel, minimum in the next one, then again a maximum and a minimum and a maximum and a minimum, and now we can write a sine wave around it, and. Uh, actually, if we would have a wave that has a higher frequency than this one, then this wave we actually cannot catch with our detector because we simply cannot describe using a 16 numbers a wave that has a k value of larger than 8. Now, uh, of course, for discrete function, we can make, uh, again, a power spectrum in a reciprocal space. In our case, this was a very simple wave uh, of a sine wave that actually, this was the uh, zero and the two pi. We only see that it has a single component of K1 and it has a certain amplitude, uh, which we have plotted here. Now, uh, for a Fourier transform, if a discrete wave, we see that we have 60 numbers describing these measured values in the real space. Whereas in the reciprocal space, we have eight values, but with eight phases. So in fact, we are again describing our wave by 16 values. Plus, there is an extra value of the DC component. Interestingly, then, uh, we, if we will rise, uh, so this will end up not in eight components, but in nine components. But if we will have more samples, then we will still add up only just one extra component of the DC component. Now, this was a 1D wave so far, and now we will go to 2D waves. Because uh, the good thing about spatial waves is that we can describe them in 2D and we then we can describe them in 3D as well. For description of 2D waves, we will make it easier if we define not only a single K number, but we will define two numbers, H number and K number. These numbers we call Miller indices. And these Miller indices you maybe already heard about uh, in X-ray crystallography will tell you about how many times the wave oscillates uh, over x-axis and how many times it oscillates over the y-axis. Now, how to imagine or uh, 2D wave? Maybe take a piece of paper and make a wave of this paper. You will see that the paper will make a plane that's oscillating up and down. And this is what you can see here. Here's a wave that's represented in grayscale, which starts uh, at zero, then it goes to the maximum of one, then it uh, again decreases to zero, it goes to minus one, and then again back to zero. If we take one line of this, uh, uh, of this plane, then we can make a profile of this line, and this is actually the real profile of the, of the line where we can see that it oscillates up and down and up. And then, again, it would follow 
but our image has a limited size so we have only one oscillation uh, over the image this is an h1 k0 wave which has an amplitude of one we see this one and a phase of zero because it starts exactly as a sine wave in zero now let's have another 2d wave another 2d wave we can describe as a wave k1 h0 k1 in case of h0 k1 we see that there are zero oscillations along the x-axis and there is one oscillation over the y-axis the amplitude of this oscillation is again one for this case this was uh, just an image generated by me and um, and if we would take the profile over the y-axis, we would see that it's again starting at, at some point a zero, going up and down and up. Oops, not all the way up, just, just, oh, sorry. Up and down and up, yeah, something like this. Whereas we, we, where we would take a line from the x-axis, then we would see that the profile at the x-axis is a kind of constant function. There is no oscillation over the uh, x-axis. That's because here the h value is 0, k value is 1. This is the spatial frequency in x-axis. This is the spatial frequency over the y-axis. Now let's take a, a look on a wave, for example, that have a... Here, actually, I have a mistake. This is a, a wave that varies an H1K0 wave. We have a wave that's actually oscillating from up to down and again up because we have a phase shift here. So actually we enter a 90 degrees phase shift which makes the, the wave start at 1 and then gradually going down until it hits its period up again in 1. These, all these waves were waves that were actually of uh, h1, k1, or a sing, uh, uh, just a single spatial frequency. Now let's go higher. Let's say that we have an h20, k0, sorry, h20, k0. What h20 tells us that actually this wave oscillates 20 times over the image along the x-axis. So what we can do is make a profile of a single line over the x-axis and we can count that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I'm pretty sure that this will end up in, in 20 waves. So this repeats over the whole image in 20, line, uh, uh, in 20 uh, repetitions. The amplitude again is 1. We can see here that it's oscillating between plus 1 and minus 1. And this is a spatial wave. This is a 2D spatial wave that's uh, passing along the x-axis and uh, have a spatial frequency of h20. Now, uh, the spatial frequencies can be negative as well. <clears throat> Here you can see for comparison how a negative uh, value would look like. It simply looks that it's not starting its journey from, from bottom to top, but it's starting from top to bottom. Now, let's go a little bit to more complicated one. Let's take a look what will happen when we will have a wave that actually has an H number, a spatial frequency or the x-axis 1, and a K number equal to 1 as well. This will be the wave that actually will make one oscillation over the x-axis as well one oscillation over the y-axis. Now what you can see that this wave actually is a diagonal wave. This wave is kind of propagating this way. So, whereas we can still see that there was only one oscillation, there's just one maximum here, there's no other maximum on, on the x-axis. And when we go on over the y-axis, we, we can see only one uh, oscillation over the y-axis, there's only one uh, maximum. But the wave, uh, the wave that this, uh, description of H1K1 generates is actually a wave that goes diagonally. Now, uh, we already shown that if we change the K from 1 to minus 1, we will get a wave that starts from, from top and, and falls to bottom. Then this wave actually will 
have a diagonally opposite direction. Still, what we can see, it only has one repetition over y, one repetition over, uh, over x. Now we can make uh, even more complex things. This is a wave that has a h2, that means two repetitions over x. You can see one repetition, second repetition, and has seven repetitions over y. We had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven repetitions. So uh, it matches up. And again, we can see that this is a kind of diagonal wave, which has again uh, some kind of uh, oscillation uh, over, the, uh, over the image. Now, what I want to tell you, uh, just to be sure, that these are not two waves. The H1K1 or H1 minus K1 or H2K7, these are not, not a, a two waves like H2 wave plus K7 wave. This is a single 2D wave. This is a single 2D wave that is described by two spatial frequencies of H2 and K7, for example. Now, uh, we already shown for 1D wave that we can sum these waves. There is uh, no problem with summing. We just take uh, the same points and, and sum them up. We can do the same for 2D waves. What you can see here is uh, our many waves that, that I generated, H4K1 with the amplitude 2, H2K2 with an amplitude 1, and then H20K0 with an amplitude 1. Here is additionally a, a phase shift. When you can see, the phase shift makes that uh, it's actually starting from, uh, from the maximum. And when we add all, up all these waves, we get this kind of strange image. But what I wanted to show you up that summing up multiple waves can make you a pattern all over the image. And the more waves you are summing up, the more patterns you are able to describe in the image. And if I would up, uh, add up not only three waves, but maybe thousands of waves, then I might build up an image out of all of these waves. Now, let's take a look on the Fourier transform of the 2D waves. The Fourier transform of the 2D waves is very similar to the Fourier transform of uh, a 1D wave. The only thing that differs is that we are now moving in two directions. So actually, uh, in a real space, we have a function that's in 2D. We can say like an image is a function in 2D, which has an x and y axis. Therefore, in the Fourier transform, we will have also two axes. We, we will have an h-axis and a k-axis. On the h-axis, we will describe the waves that are repeating over the x axis. With the k, we are defining the waves that are repeating over the y-axis. And there are combinations of the waves which, uh, which have a certain amount of h and k, and this is a combination that, of waves that are spreading over the x and y-axis simultaneously at a certain angle. Now, if we do a Fourier transform, what we will end up, actually, is a series of phases and amplitudes. Uh, in this image, uh, we don't have it, uh, uh, the amplitude and the phase below we have next to each other. So this is actually one Fourier component. This is another Fourier component. The very first Fourier component we see is A0, P0. This is the DC component, as we already talked about. Uh, we will show later how DC component influence the, influences the image. Uh, now, uh, I showed you that for an H K1 we have a wave and the H H1 K1 we have a wave and for H1 K minus wave one we have a wave that differs in the direction. Yeah, if one goes uh, in the direction from the uh, lower left to the uh, upper right and one starts from the upper left to and ends up in the lower right. Therefore, by convention for the Fourier space, or the Fourier transform, we need to, uh, to be able to completely describe all the Fourier components, we need this part of the k, which, also, which goes from 0 to 5 and from 0 to minus 5, but only we need the part for h 
that goes from 0 to 5. Whereas if we would go in negatively, the h's would go negatively, this would be very similar that we had in the 1d waves, where the k1 was equal to k minus 1. So actually we, did, uh, we were not able to distinguish in between waves that, may, uh, that passed in this direction or the other direction. The, the thing that why we are going, we are taking the h only from 0 to 5 in this case and the k from minus 5 to 5 and not the opposite way is just some convention. Now, for a 10 by 10 image which has 10 pixels in x-axis and 10 pixels in y-axis, we will end up with Fourier components that will have actually uh, uh, in the x-axis it will go from uh, from zero to the Nyquist component and in the y-axis as well. Yeah, this will be five. As well, we told that because of the combination of these waves, there is another. There will be some redundancy uh, in this uh, Fourier space, but nevertheless, uh, we will need to describe completely uh, the waves present in this image, we will need to have 5 times 10, it's 50, times 2, because for every component we have an amplitude and phase, that ends up in 100, which is actually the number of numbers that we have in the real space image. Again, we have here this part of the DC component, that is something extra, but uh, this won't scale linearly when we will increase the size of the image. This will be just a single addition to it. Now, what we have here is we have a single, for example, let's take a single Fourier component here. This is the A10. That means A10, that is the amplitude of wave that has H1, K0, as well the phase of this. Uh, of this wave. So we take a wave that actually is described by this Fourier component and we plot this wave. Then we take another Fourier component, we add to the previous wave. And uh, when we add all these components, for example, component of uh, A23, that means that it has an H2 and a K3, and this will be some wave that's going diagonally, uh, then we end up with this image, actually what we have in the real space. So uh, actually, when we are transforming from real space to Fourier space, we are not losing information. We are just changing the way how we are looking at that image, where we are looking at the image in the real space or we are looking at the image at the Fourier space. Uh, again, and the further to the left or uh, to the right or uh, the higher we are going, then finer frequencies we are describing by these Fourier components. So this is an A uh, amplitude of, a, of H5. This will uh, describe a wave that's passing five times over uh, the x-axis, which we already said that this is the, the finest frequency that we can catch in an image that has only 10 samples over the x-axis. This is again the Nyquist component. Now, uh, the 2 d Fourier transform uh, of the wave we already described. Uh, again, there's a way how to show it in, a, uh, in some image or in some plots. These plots now have two axes of H and K. And, oops. and on this axis, we are actually plotting again a power spectrum. Now, every point in this power spectrum that we'll plot the intensity of this point will represent the amplitude of that, uh, of that wave. So here we have an H1, K0 wave. We know that uh, on the H equals to 1, we put one dot here. That will have an amplitude of 1. So the dot actually comes out a little bit of an image or it has some intensity this this point. As well as we know that for the same frequency, the negative frequency, we have to make a, a point in the power spectrum as well. Now, uh, here we have a wave that's actually traveling across, it's traveling this direction, and these parameters are H1 and K1. 
now we are going in the plot to a place where h equals to 1 and to the place where oops, where k equals to 1 and we are plotting a number uh, we are plotting a single dot here which intensity of the dot will represent the amplitude of this wave so let's say that the intensity here will be of 1 let's move further here's another wave this wave has an h4 k1 we go here here is h4 we go here here's k1 again hk hasn't changed yeah for for this we have this plot for this we have this plot now the interesting part is that we have, we have sum of waves then when we plot the Fourier spectra of this wave we will see distinct points where actually there is a Fourier component from the image so if this uh, image is composed only of three waves that therefore these three waves has only three Fourier components it has a Fourier component of H4K1, H2K2, and H20K0. And the value of the Fourier components for H4K1 is an amplitude 2, for H2K2 component is an amplitude 1, plus everywhere we need to know about phase shift. However, the phase shift we are never plotting out. Therefore, we have only a power spectra that in fact is a combination of these three power spectra because the resulting wave was also a combination of these three waves. Now you can see that if you take a look on the power spectra, you can roughly see of how many waves the image actually consists of and what are the properties of the waves. If there are waves of very high frequency, like here we have, this was an H20 wave, and if there are waves of low frequency, which actually is one of these waves, this is the wave of uh, H2K2, this we can see out from the power spectra. Usually the power spectra is not that uh, simple as here that we have only a few spots. The power spectra usually has uh, lots of spots. But still, sometimes you just take a look on the power spectra and you see that there is something strange with the image. This image is missing the high frequencies. And this is something that you simply cannot see from the real space image. You can see it only from the Fourier space image that actually from the image the high frequencies are missing or the low frequencies are missing or a certain frequency is missing. Now uh, we need to be sure, uh, just to make it clear, that again uh, representation in a reciprocal space is equal to representation in uh, real space, it looks just a little bit different. And when we want to convert in between these spaces, we use the Fourier transformation. So, so we Fourier tr if we Fourier transform this uh, uh, reciprocal space, or make an inverse Fourier transform the reciprocal space, we will end up with an image in the real space. When we take a Fourier transform of the real space image, we will end up in the reciprocal space. These two spaces are interchangeable. Now, this is the time when I uh, turn to the dark side of the presentation. This is because it is such hard to represent a 3D wave uh, on a power presentation. Now, uh, we knew that when we had a 1D wave, we were describing these waves with an amplitude in the phase of a, a wave of certain k number of Miller index of k, which was uh, at the spatial frequency. In the case of 2D waves, we have two Miller indices. It was H and K. This was, again, a spatial frequency along the x-axis and the y-axis. Now we have 3D waves. And in 3D, we have three Miller indices. One, one is the H, one is the K, and one is the L. So, again, the H is the spatial frequency of the wave that's oscillating along the x-axis. The K is oscillating along the y-axis and the L is oscillating somehow this way along the z-axis. Now, how to, how to uh, visualize a 3D wave? It's very hard. I try to generate a 3D wave and visualize it in, uh, in a program called Chimera, which is usually used for visualization of molecular uh, of PDB molecules, or, but as well, uh, it's useful for visualization of densities. So 
how we can visualize this 3D wave is a kind of density in the space that oscillates up and down. You can see that this, uh, uh, this wave is oscillating from, from zero, it's going to its maximum, then it's going again to zero, it's going to its minimum, and then it's ending up again in the zero. This is a 3D sine wave. This is a 3D sine wave that has Miller coefficients of Miller indices of uh, H1, K0, L0. That means that the spatial frequency in the x axis is y, while there is no spatial frequency along the y axis or along the z axis. Now, Let's take a different wave where it will be maybe a little more clear how uh, this density oscillates over the space, a 3D space. Uh, here we have a wave that has an H2 and K3. So we have an H2, it's oscillating one time, two time. We have a K3, it's oscillating one time, two time, three time. You see the spatial frequency uh, around the x-axis, the spatial frequency around the y-axis. Again, what we can see, this is a spatial wave in 3D that's oscillating diagonally. So it has a maximum going to zero, minimum going to zero, maximum, uh, yes, and so on and so on. And we can see that it's oscillating over this, uh, this line diagonally. Still. What we have here is we still haven't used our last mill in this the L0. Uh, to make you clear, to make a 3D wave, we don't need to use all the Miller indices. It's not necessary to have H1, K1, L1 to have a 3D wave. No, H1, K0, L0 is describing a 3D wave as well. It's only describing one of the possibilities of the 3D wave in the, uh, in the space that actually has just one oscillation over the x-axis and has zero oscillations around the, uh, around the y-axis and the z-axis. But this is a full-featured, let's say, full-featured 3D wave. It doesn't matter that the Miller indices of k is zero or the l is zero. Now, this will be a 3D wave where we have a spatial frequency set for all the three components, the H is equals to 2, K equals to 3, and L equals to 4. You can see that H equals to 1, 2 oscillations, K equals to 1, 2, 3 oscillations, and now we want to see the 4 oscillations, but this is very hard to see it when we are looking from the front, because actually the density of the waves is, uh, uh, is hiding the z-axis. So I had to turn it slightly, maybe 45 degrees, and we can see that it's actually one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, four times uh, the z-axis. So this is a 3D wave that's actually described by three Miller indices of non-zero values. What we can do in the 3D is, again, we can sum up waves. Uh, I'm not showing which waves I summed up. I, uh, I summed up three waves that has a variable HK and L values and added them together. And what we got is a very interesting thing. This is something that looks like a cloud. This cloud has a very high intensities, very low intensities, and it has zero intensities as well. And it fills all the cube of the space that we have here. If you take a look, this is somehow very similar to maybe some of you already seen is, is a density of electrons over the space. This is only, a, these are only few waves that I added up, there are only three waves, and the spatial frequency of these waves were uh, roughly uh, two, three, or four uh, in the range of uh, spatial frequency values, but we can add up uh, spatial frequencies of, uh, of uh, we can uh, add up 3D waves of much higher spatial frequencies, and if we end up with adding up all the combinations of spatial frequencies uh, uh, and the Miller indices, we can actually create a 3D volume that makes sense. This is very similar to what we were talking about in case of 2D images, that we uh, actually can describe all the images, 2D images, with an appropriate set of phases amplitudes plus uh, the spatial frequencies. Now, a 3D Fourier transform 
therefore will be very similar to a 2D Fourier transform, only you will have an extra axis of L. So what we have here is a kind of 2D Fourier transform that has extra layers that are going in the L axis and the L axis against passes from 0, minus 5 to 0 to 5, where we uh, started our uh, Fourier transform from a cube that has a 10 times 10 times 10 pixels or 10 times 10 times 10 voxels. Again, the very first value will be the DC component. And the very last value here will be the Nyquist component. Again, the highest frequency that we can uh, represent by our real space uh, volume uh, is the half of the number of voxels or the pixels, we say. Again, what we have is uh, here we have the A100. Here we have the A110. And if we go one layer to the back, there we, uh, at this place, we would have the A111. Yeah. Uh, as well, we cannot forget about the phases. 1, 0, and P, 1, 0, 0. Again, uh, we take a wave, a 3D wave, that has a, uh, a spatial frequency of H1, K0, L0, and an amplitude of this, and the phase of this, and we sum up with, with this wave, and this wave, and this wave, and all the, all the waves in the Fourier space. Now, uh, I'm not going to represent how uh, actually a 3D power spectra looks like, but you can imagine uh, that it's very similar to a 2D power spectra, but just in a 3D. It has a center from where you're going to the left and right in the H-axis, to the front and uh, to the up and down in the K-axis, and the front and back in the L-axis. Yeah. Uh, it will be very hard to represent, but still, if you get a certain combination of HKL, at that, uh, at that volume point, you just place a point a voxel, which will represent, actually, uh, by the brightness, the amplitude of that Fourier component. Now, here I would just show you what actually a 3D reconstruction is. Maybe some of you already did some, done something in, uh, uh, in cryopter microscopy or X-ray crystallography, and then you heard something about that. We aligned all our images, or uh, we sold our diffraction spectra, and then we made a 3D reconstruction. What actually a 3D reconstruction is? What we already told about, that the reciprocal space of a 1D wave is equivalent to a wave in the real space of one dimension. A 2D reciprocal space is equivalent to a 2D wave in the, uh, in the uh, real space. This is true for the 3D reciprocal space as well. What you are doing is uh, either you are solving your X-ray structure or you are uh, solving your cryo structure uh, you are filling into every of these small cube the phases, and these are cubes, yeah? So this is going like... It's a very big cube sliced up into small cubes, and in every small cube we have a representation of phase and, and amplitudes, and uh, during uh, our uh, projection matching step where we are looking for the best orientations of the 2D images, we are finding the best angles, and this best angles tells us that the actual 2D uh, image Fourier transform, transform is filling by its components all these small cubes, and in the small cubes we will fill up with phases and amplitudes our 3D Fourier space. 
and we still don't know how actually our reconstruction will look like. What we will do is actually we will take every single amplitude and phase of the 3D wave and add them with the other 3D waves and this combination or the summation of all the 3D waves will actually build up your beautiful 3D density map. This is what we are calling the 3D reconstruction. This you already heard about in lecture 3 when you, uh, uh, when you were learning about X-ray crystallography and this is something that I want to show you that actually many principles from X-ray crystallography, if not all of them, are applicable for cryotherm microscopy as well. What you actually measure in, uh, uh, in X-ray crystallography is a power spectra. You get the diffraction pattern, it's a kind of power spectra, it's a kind of Fourier transform of a single plane of your crystal. Then you are rotating your crystal and you are filling up all the single uh, or, or many of these uh, um, Fourier components uh, in the X-ray crystallography, you are not filling all of them because you have distinct reflections. So some of them will be empty, but uh, some of them will be filled by the intensity at a certain uh, reflection spot. Then what you are doing is you are uh, converting it back to real space by a 3D reconstruction by inverse Fourier transform. And now here's the problem in X-ray crystallography. What you measure is actually the intensity of the power spectra power spectrum and this power spectrum is representing only the amplitudes it's not representing the phases and that's why uh, x-ray crystallographers has uh, methods a set and mad methods uh, to solve this problem they cause this the phase problem and you already heard about isomorphous replacement animal scattering and all, all this stuff how you can approximate or, or the molecular uh, replacement how you can assign actually to every amplitude a phase as well. But by the measurement itself in X-ray crystallography, you are measuring only the amplitudes, not the phases. In cryo-EM it's a little bit more complicated, or maybe more straightforward. In cryo-EM, because you are measuring real space images, these real space images are containing phases and, uh, and amplitudes as well. Because if we want to get uh, the power spectra out of them, we need to do a Fourier transform. Whereas in uh, X-ray crystallography, we are already measuring the Fourier transform. So this uh, nice equation that you've learned on lecture three, if you if you haven't uh, learned about this, please go back, take a look on lecture three. That what we are doing, we are summing up all the waves that has a certain amplitude at the HKL value. So we are first, let's go integrating from H1 to K0, L0, H2, K0, L0, H3, H4, H5. Then we will have H1, K1, L0, H1, K, H2, K1, L0, and so on. And we will go for all this single cell, single Fourier space, uh, uh, reciprocal space component. And we take a look, what's the actual amplitude in this cell and what's the phase in this cell and then what we are doing we are adding up all these uh, waves uh, into in every single point on the 3d space for x y and z this is what we call the 3d reconstruction and you see that it's not a magic it's it's simple maths and you i think roughly now know how this works because we know how uh, the waves adds up and the adding up of the waves in the 3D is essentially the same as adding up a wave in 1D. It's just uh, a little bit harder to describe visually, but essentially it's the same. Now, there are a few things that's uh, really uh, good to know about the reciprocal space. Every single point in the reciprocal space affects all the points in the real space, and this is a very crucial thing. Now, <clears throat> uh, because uh, in the real space you have single points in the image and in the reciprocal space you have a wave that's describing the image uh, and you are in the reciprocal space you are describing this wave actually you will find out that in every point of the image all the waves 
in the reciprocal space are building up. So every single point in the image is composed of all the waves in the reciprocal space. So if we take out a single wave in the reciprocal space, then we will actually affect all the points in the real space. Vice versa, if we just remove a single point in the real space, then we will change the shifts and the amplitudes of all the waves in the reciprocal space to actually build up the, the new image that differs only in a single pixel, let's say. So uh, you have to be careful about that, that when you are talking about the reciprocal space and the real space, then every single point in the real space affects all the points in the reciprocal space, whereas all the points in the reciprocal space affects all the points, uh, uh, whereas every point in the reciprocal space affects all the points in the real space. And this is, this is simply something that you uh, cannot point out that, okay, I have this pixel in the real space and the corresponding pixel in the reciprocal space power spectrum. There's no corresponding pixel. The corresponding uh, to, to the certain pixel in the real space, actually the corresponding is all the waves in the reciprocal space because all the addition of up these waves will form the final pixel or the value of this final pixel. Now, uh, this was the second point. The third point, more far from the center of the power spectrum, the higher the spatial frequency is. The higher the spatial frequency is, the more detail we can describe with these waves. So actually, uh, the higher we go with the spatial frequency, the higher oscillation waves we are including into our image, and the higher the oscillation is, the more fine details we are able to describe in our image or in our volume or even in our 1D wave. While only amplitudes are represented in the power spectrum, the underlying phases are equally important and this we already discussed uh, a lot. We know why this is very important. We know why there is actually a phase problem in, uh, in X-ray crystallography. In cryogenium actually we don't have this problem we have other challenges. Now, uh, just show uh, a few of uh, the, the properties of the reciprocal space. Here we have an image. <clears throat> I'm showing you uh, this image It's because uh, this lady is more beautiful than am I. Uh, and this is a kind of standard picture for image processing, uh, maybe by the end of the presentation or the lecture. I will tell you how and why actually this lady is representing some kind of standard for image processing. But name uh, of this lady is Lena. So let's see what Lena look like looks like in reciprocal space. Well, not bad. Actually, we can see that uh, Lena is composed of DC component and she is composed of low frequency waves, middle frequency waves and high frequency waves. Nice. Actually, every image is composed of all these waves that, uh, that you see here. What you can see in the, uh, in the image that actually the image is point symmetric, that you can see that this part is the same from here to here. You can see the same as well from here to here. Therefore, that's again what, what I told you that we are representing on the uh, age going to uh, zero to the half of the image size and k is going to the zero to the plus half and the minus half. So actually this half of the Fourier space, of this, this Fourier spectrum is enough to fully describe this image. Nevertheless, we always show the, the full Fourier spectrum with the negative values as well, but these negative values are reciprocal to the, to the positive ones. So if, the, if there's a point here, there will be certainly a point here as well. Now, let's see what happens to Lena when we apply uh, a cutoff in, inside the uh, Fourier space. So we will take the power spectra and at a certain distance from the center, we will zero all the values. So we will zero all the amplitudes. That means that these waves that are underlying these amplitudes, let's say here is something like K50, when the K51 has an amplitude of zero, K52 uh, has a, a 
age uh, 51 has amplitude of 0, 52, 53, and so on, and 256 has uh, amplitude of value 0 as well. That means that these waves are not affecting the picture as at all. It's not affecting the real space at all. So what we are doing here, we are only letting pass through only the low frequencies. And this is what we call a low pass filter. What a low pass filter does is that it actually blurs our image. The low pass filter removes the high frequencies. And what the high frequencies do, the high frequencies are adding up details. You can see that we are missing the crisp in her eyes. We are missing all the details uh, on, on her head. This is uh, something that's missing. And why it is missing? It's missing because we removed all the Fourier components in the Fourier space that are providing the high resolution, the high frequency information. Now, you can see as well that there's a strange halo around, uh, there are fringes and halos uh, around Lena. This is uh, because uh, we applied a very sharp filter here that is a very sharp edge. And when you are doing this kind of very hard and sharp masking, then you always introduce uh, some artifacts in the real space. Later, you, we will show in another example how we can remove this kind of artifacts. Now, another filter that we can apply will be a filter where we zero all the low frequencies and we let to pass all the high frequencies. Because we already discussed about this, we know that this will end up in an image of Lena that's carrying the high frequency information that's actually carrying the, the details. And as well, because of the step function that we already discussed that it needs high frequencies to be uh, described, this also uh, shows you all the sharp edges. You can see that she uh, that on in the image there are some sharp edges of the hat and other uh, areas, and you can see all these sharp edges that are highlighted in a high pass filter. This is nothing else. If uh, if you take your Photoshop, you take an image, and you ask Photoshop to find edges. What Photoshop does, in fact, is a kind of high pass filtering it, and then contrast enhancing it to make it uh, visually even more pleasurable. Now there's another filter that's, uh, that we can do very easily. This filter will block out all the high frequencies and the part of low frequencies and it will just let you a little bit of middle frequencies. Now you can play around what amount of middle frequencies you want. If you want to make the circle larger or smaller, this one larger or smaller. In any case, we will call this filter a bandpass filter. And how a bandpass filter looks is this. This is something that's very hard to describe in real space. What happened to Lena? Lena is a little bit blurred, but we can still see some sharp edges. Um, image is more flat. It's, it's really hard to describe by, by words what happened. In the Fourier space, however, we can clearly state that we applied a bandpass filter that is letting only these frequencies that are higher than a certain spatial frequency and lower than a certain spatial frequency. Later, uh, we will show where we can uh, see a kind of uh, bandpass filter in cryo EM. Now, the DC component in an image. We know that in the very middle of the Fourier transform, there is a single pixel that's a, that's a middle point that's representing the DC component. What will happen when we take out this DC component out of the image? Wow, somebody turned off the light. So, as we told about before, the DC component is adding a kind of middle intensity over all the image. So what you can see here that this image is brighter than this one, but the way it's brighter, it's uniformly brighter. That means that DC component is a constant function that adds up to every single pixel in the image. Uh, Uh, in electron microscopy, you will see that the kind of DC component in the bright field microscopy will be the unscattered electron that's hitting right in the middle of the Fourier space in the back focal plane. Now, just another property of uh, 
uh, of a power spectrum is a real space rotation of the image. We took Lena and rotated by 90 degrees. What we can see in the, real, uh, in the Fourier space that actually the Fourier space amplitudes rotated as well. So if we make a rotation in real space, that will certainly rotate the Fourier space as well. Because we know that if there was a, a wave, an a H wave that was passing, one, uh, let's say two times over this uh, x-axis, when we rotate it by 90 degrees, actually from the H wave, we will get a K wave that will, rot uh, that will pass through the y-axis, not the x-axis, and therefore all the reciprocal space will be rotated by 90 degrees. Now, let's make the magic happen. Real space shift image translation. Here I only padded Lena uh, with a black square that's adding no information to, uh, to the image itself. There are only zero values. Just because I uh, didn't want it to get rid of the piece of Rana when I'm doing the translation, so I didn't want it to cut a piece of, uh, of this image off. I padded it with a black square and now I'm translating Lena a little bit uh, to the right and a little bit uh, to the bottom. You can see here the translated image. Now let's take a look how this looks in the Fourier space. Actually, you might think that I messed up these two images and then I'm showing you the same uh, power spectrum of both images. Uh, for both images. Actually, I really consciously made the, the power spectrum in image J. You can uh, actually play, play in image J yourself uh, with this image. You can freely download that software. And what, what came up was reciprocal space that is identical. I knew that it will be identical, I wanted to show you. So why is it so? Because if you think about this image, we shifted the image, but actually we are still, we can still describe the, uh, the image itself by exactly the same waves, exactly the same amplitudes of the waves. We haven't changed anything in the, else in the image. We are not uh, getting uh, off the details, we are not adding information to the image because it's uh, still uh, around black, black square. But still, there must be something that's changed. And actually, what's changing here is the phase. If we plot out the phases, which is a kind of strange plot and it's very hard to interpret what you have here. Here, I plotted out the phases just to show you that actually, while the amplitude of both of the images is the same, when you are translating, you are phase shifting the waves. And this is not hard to, uh, to understand. If we have a wave, that's going over this image like this, when we are actually shifting the image, then all the waves, and this wave as well, will phase shift. And that means that the wave will start somewhere here, and we will shift the, uh, uh, the wave like this. Yeah. So actually, what uh, we do, uh, if we do a phase shift in a reciprocal space, we are doing a shift of the image, in the real space. It is very good to know. As well as uh, because of the very fine feature of, uh, of the phases that you can very finely change the phases in the uh, reciprocal space, you can sometimes make a uh, image shift that's actually a sub-pixel uh, size. So you can virtually change the image the way that it's shifted by less than a pixel which is, uh, in fact, invisible in the uh, real space, but it's clearly visible in the reciprocal space because the phase has changed. Now, uh, maybe the last thing I think that I will show you is the Fourier space cropping and Fourier space padding. Here we have Lena, here is the Fourier sp uh, space transform or the power spectrum of Lena. The power spectrum itself has the si exactly the size of the image, so if this was a 512 by 512 image, this power spectrum will be 512 by 512, whereas we, only, uh, we know that only half of it is useful, is this 256 per 512 is useful, but nevertheless we always show all the power spectrum. Now what will happen if we crop out the middle part, evenly the middle part of this power spectrum, and we, we, we will crop it. So uh, if you go back 
uh, when we describe how a 2D Fourier space, uh, uh, 2D reciprocal space looked like, it was described by uh, uh, H components that uh, started at uh, 1 and ended up by the half of the image size. So in this case, it would be 256. So it was 1 and uh, 256. I'm sorry, here is the one. Uh, starting on 256. Now, the 256 we called as the Nyquist frequency or the Nyquist component. Now, what we did, we cut off a, sp a part of the Fourier space. And actually, now we are not ending up in 256, but we are ending up maybe at uh, 165. What will happen when we do an inverse Fourier transform? Well, we'll find that actually uh, our image will stay the same because our image is still composed from the same low frequency components. What we did, we removed the high frequency components, but as well, we, we already told the transform process itself that the highest frequency uh, available in this image will be of 165 spatial frequency, which equals to the double of the pixels of the image. So if 165 uh, is the spatial frequency, then 200, 330 will be the real space size of the image. So what we actually got here is downscaling. We downscaled the image, we made it smaller, uh, we haven't cropped it, be, be sure, we haven't done something like this that we'd cropped out part of Lena. We, we were not cropping out. We were evenly downscaling all because we just removed the high frequency components and now we are describing our image with less Fourier components that will show us an image that's more. This is also the fact that uh, you will see that every, low, uh, every downscaling is actually also low pass filtering. Why? because we are removing the high frequencies. So this way you can really understand that if you are downscaling some image, it doesn't matter if you're doing it Photoshop or, or a scientific program, you will see that you are losing high detail information. You are losing high frequency information. And if you would go, want to go back, you simply would not gain back this information. It's irreversible loss because we just scrubbed it out. Now for Fourier space padding, we can take this uh, uh, image and uh, pad it uh, with an evenly black square. Now, what we are telling for the inverse Fourier transform that actually we gained the very last frequencies that we have more that our pic uh, that our picture our image will have more pixels. What we are, however, not including here is any information any information around that we padded, we padded with zero, so all the amplitudes are zero, and therefore this part of the image is not adding any information to the image. So what we actually will have, we will have a larger image of Lena, however, it won't be more detailful than the original image. It will be only bigger. I hope that you understood why it is so. Now, the very last thing that's very important uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for the Fourier space is convolution. Convolution is a mathematical operation on two functions that produces a third function that expresses how the shape of one is modified by the other. This was uh, defined somewhere on Wikipedia, and it's very hard at first to understand, but I will try to show you how actually convolution of two functions will look like. A convolution is denoted by this uh, sign of uh, crossing a circle and actually the mathematic definition is an integral from minus infinitive to plus infinitive of one function times the second function which is shifted by the dx of, uh, of this integral. So what we are doing, we are actually moving one function over the other function and we are integrating what's, what's covered by the uh, product is the product we are multiplying by the product of these two functions to make it more clear how it uh, looks like uh, I, I just uh, 
made it a bit like what what to say about convolutions to pass function f or function g and take an array under. This is how it looked like. We have a function uh, f that uh, it was more clearly visible here. It, it's a square function and then other function that's a triangular function. And what we are starting to do is that we are gradually moving one function over the other. This is integrating from minus infinitive, whereas in minus infinitive it was always zero, so it was not interesting for us. It starts to be interesting now when this is starting to cross these two, two functions. So we are moving one function over the other function and we are taking a look in every point what's the product of the function and what's actually the area of this product. And the area of this product will be the convolution. So if we go up here, we see that already the product reached the maximum, or the convolution is still not at the maximum because this area is still smaller than the maximum of it, which is actually this point, where we have the product of this function with this part of the blue function, and it's ending up with the biggest area under the resulting function. That's the integral, you see. So we are gradually moving over, and then we will get to a point where this uh, this way or, or this function can move to the right indefinitely, but it will be always zero, we see. So there's no reason to, to follow up. What we certainly got is something very complex. We would not expect that the convolution of this sharp function with a sharp uh, brick would give us something smooth like this. So actually in real space to describe convolutions is, is very high. But there is a convolution theorem which states that actually a convolution in a real space of function f and h, this is in the real space, convolution of f and h in real space is actually a, a multiplication, a basic mathematical multiplication in the Fourier space of the Fourier transform of the f and h. And that will, of course, produce a Fourier transform of the g. If we want to get the g, the only thing we need to do is take the multiplication of these two Fourier transform and make an inverse Fourier transform of it. Pretty easy. So while in real space it's very hard to do a convolution, in reciprocal space because of the convolution theorem it's quite easy. Now how a convolution on our lena would look like is uh, like we convolve lena with a Gaussian wave. So in every point of this image of Lena, we are convolving the pixel with the wave of a Gaussian curve. What we will end up is again some blurring. But how would this look like in Fourier space? This is the Fourier space, uh, it's a reciprocal space a refer, uh, representation of Lena, and we are multiplying it with a function that actually this look like a very soft function, it has a peak, and Actually, the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is another Gaussian. But the other Gaussian in the Fourier space will be uh, the, the thicker the, the, thicker the uh, Gaussian is in the uh, real space, the thinner it will be in the Fourier space. So this would be the Fourier transform of this Gaussian. But if we have another Gaussian, uh, in color. If we have a Gaussian like this, then actually the Fourier transform of that Gaussian would look like this. So the thicker in real space, the thinner in the Fourier space. And what we are doing is that we are uh, multiplying all the amplitudes uh, with the amplitudes of the Gaussian. And what we get is exactly the same. So uh, again, uh, another thing what you can see that this Gaussian was a uh, virtual low-pass filter, and what you can see on this low-pass filter image that there are no artifacts that I showed you previously as fringes. This is because now we applied a kind of soft filter, not a sharp-edged filter. This uh, Gaussian function that we uh, multiplied with our image is in this case called the point spread function. This is the function that defines that every point in the image will be spread 
by the convolution of this point spread function and the image itself, and that will produce uh, uh, as the resulting image. So this is important to know what point spread function is. Now, this is the end of the Fourier space. I hope that you already get some uh, basic info how a Fourier transform works, how 1D uh, waves, 2D waves, 3D waves, adds up, uh, how we can make 3D reconstruction. Now, we are going uh, to apply a, a bit of this uh, in microscopy, and later on you will apply a lot more of this uh, in the reconstruction and the, and the alignment methods presented by Yuzhi Novacek. But uh, now I will focus more on the image formation, how the image is formed in the microscope. <clears throat> you remember from the very last uh, uh, lecture that uh, electron can be scattered by multiple ways. One of the way is that the electron is non-scattered. This is uh, not the case of scattering. The other uh, part is uh, some inelastically scattered electron that passes part of the energy to another electron which changes its orbital when it goes back, it emits an X-ray, or it can kick off, uh, actually, the, uh, the electron out from the orbital. What we are the most interested is the elastic scattering, because that's the most predictable scattering. So what we will follow up uh, will be the elastic scattering of the electrons and how this elastic scattering builds up the image in the micro microscope. Now, Electron scattering and them image formation uh, all goes back to lecture two, the Bragg's law. I hope all you understood what Bragg's law is uh, is talking you about. Actually, uh, it's showing you that when an X-ray comes to a, a plane and when it gets reflected or scattered from from this plane, then actually this plane uh, this has some oscillation, and it will have an oscillation as well when it passes through. But because these two planes uh, are further apart, then this ray has to go some extra distance and therefore there was some phase shift and uh, only at certain fulfilled conditions we get two red, uh, red rays that are actually in phase and they are producing a constructive wave. Now, uh, also from Bragg's law, you know that uh, uh, there are only uh, distinct uh, differences in between these called Bragg planes that will uh, make you a constructive uh, scattering and that will as well affect the angle of scattering theta. Now, I will try. Th this, is, this was for the X-ray. I, I won't go in depth because we don't have time how the scattering works, but it was very well explained in lecture two. Lecture two. So go back to lecture two to find out how why the Bragg's law works like this and how the scattering works. Now I will try to apply this for electron microscopy. So I will try to transform all this Bragg's law into electron microscope. The easiest way and maybe the only way how I can do it is this. The only thing what I did is I exchanged X-rays to electrons the scattered X-rays to scattered electrons, but everything else remained the same. Of course, here the wavelength won't be the wavelength of X-ray, but will be the wavelength of electron. But actually, what was true for the X-rays in terms of scattering is true for the electrons as well. This is why uh, you already know that many things that you heard about in the description of X-ray crystallography is true for the electron microscopy as well. Now, uh, we know that there are these Bragg planes uh, that uh, have distinct values, a distance between the Bragg planes that will add up to a constructive scattering. And we know that uh, these, uh, the more condensed these Bragg planes are, the higher the angle of scattering actually is. So some people call these uh, scattering centers, these red dots. We, we can think about this like, like small points where scattering happens, or we can think about the planes where scattering uh, happens. Nevertheless, here's the incident electron. And when we are, uh, when the electron is describing a feature that is actually of low resolution because these planes are far from each other, it's scattering at a low angle. Whereas uh, if their features are more condensed, there are the Bragg planes are more condensed than scattered at a higher angle and the highest angle for the highest resolution information. You still need to fulfill this uh, 
Brax condition. This is very important in electron microscopy as well. But this is only for the description of how the electron scattering actually works. Now let's see what's happening actually inside the microscope. We have an incident electron that's passing through our sample and we have a wave that's actually unscattered, it's going through the optical axis. We have another uh, a wave of an uh, other point of the sample that's trailing the same. Uh, interesting part will come now that now we have an electron that is scattered under a certain angle. You can see that it's, uh, this electron is uh, not any more 180 degrees to the original electron, but there's uh, some angle of scattering. And because all these uh, rays are par parallel to each other, that's also the property of the scattered electron waves, uh, of the constructive scattered electron waves, and these waves are in phase, then uh, actually a lens, an electromagnetic lens, or any lens of, uh, uh, that will bend the electrons, which in this case is only the electromagnetic lens, will produce a focal point at this distance, which is called the back focal plane, and it will travel up to the uh, to the imaging plane, where it will combine with the unscattered rays or uh, uh, unscattered electrons. Now we'll take another electron, and we can see that these electrons are scattered even at a higher angle. They are moving more to the uh, side of the electron lens. And these are, uh, again, uh, making a focal point at the back focal plane and going down to form an image. The image itself is magnif ma uh, magnified. We already told about this the last time when we were describing lens. Now, here's the back focal plane. The interesting part about back focal plane is that at the back focal plane, you have actually the Fourier transform of the image of the sample. So what the lens does is that it's condensing all these rays into distinct points in the back focal plane where they are actually in the reciprocal space and they, the, all these uh, points are representing some amplitudes in the reciprocal space. And because uh, the rays are condensed uh, by uh, the rays are condensed by the lens and passes through, they are actually, what, what's done here by the lens is done a uh, inverse Fourier transform in the, of the image. And you end up on the image plane where a real space image is formed. <clears throat> now, a very interesting part that we already talked about. Take a look on this point in the Fourier space. Here we have a point in the Fourier space. I already told you about that every point in the Fourier space actually affects all the points in the real space. Now take a look. This point in the Fourier space actually affects this ray, this ray, and this ray. All these scattered rays are uh, a part of all the points in the real space. This is, the, uh, this is true for this and for this ray as well. If we would plot more and more rays, we will find that actually every point in the Fourier space will be a part of a point in the real space. Now what we can do, we can add an objective aperture. We talked about objective apertures the last time. And uh, what an objective aperture is, is a small hole actually masking out some part of the Fourier space. And we can choose an objective aperture that will actually let you pass all these frequencies in the Fourier space, but will block these rays. So these rays are not more part of the image. And if this uh, uh, and because a, a f an aperture is a circular uh, hole, then virtually, uh, and if it's well centered, then virtually we are doing a kind of low pass filtering in the Fourier space. If you take a look, we remove all the amplitudes that are uh, at, at a certain distance from the center. Yeah? And these Fourier components are not anymore part of the real space image. Now, uh, just to make easier to understand what will happen in, uh, the next, I will just show you some properties of some phase shifted waves. Uh, what we have here, uh, we have two waves here, Fx and Gx, whereas the important part here is that the difference in the amplitudes is quite big. Here I uh, designed two waves that one has amplitude of 2 and the second one has amplitude of 0 0.2, which is 10 times the difference in the amplitude. And we are going to describe what will happen if these uh, waves are in phase 
or out of phase by a certain uh, phase shift. So uh, what we have here is the amplitude of, uh, of the wave F, which is in purple, and then we have an amplitude of the G, uh, which is in red. We see that the amplitude of G is a lot uh, smaller than the amplitude of F. Therefore, if uh, uh, we add together these two amplitudes, we know that in argon di diagram, we can simply move uh, the beginning of one vector to the end of the other vector, and this will build up of the sum, and the uh, resulting wave actually will be a wave that will be, uh, have a higher amplitude, a considerably higher amplitude. You can see that if you compare it with the original amplitude, it's considerably higher, but it, and it will have the same uh, phase. You can see it in the plot as well. This is a dashed line, uh, uh, what ended up when we added these two phase unshifted waves. Now let's shift it by pi half. When we shift this uh, wave by pi half, <coughs> uh, now the important part is that we shift the red wave in relative to the purple wave by pi half. Yeah. So we introduce the phase shift of the red wave in relative to the, pi half, uh, to the purple wave by relative pi half. That means that actually these two vectors become perpendicular to each other. And we, when we add perpendicular vectors, we can apply the same uh, thing that we will move uh, the big, beginning of one vector to the end of the other vector, and then we uh, line up the resulting vector of it. And what we have now is, is a resulting vector that actually has changed the phase, but that's not that important for us for, uh, for now. The most important part is that it's almost the same of the amplitude that the origin uh, that the purple wave has. If you take a look in our image of the waves, you can see that there's a slight wave shift, uh, slice, slice, uh, there's a small uh, phase shift, but almost no change in the amplitude of these two waves. So virtually the amplitude of the wave, of the purple wave, or the bigger wave, has not changed. Now let's take another uh, uh, other phase shift, and this phase shift will be the phase shift where we shifted by a full half circle the phase of the red wave uh, in comparison with the phase of the purple wave. So we have a purple wave, and now the phase of the red wave is turned by 180 degrees bar, uh, by pi. Well, we see it's facing opposite length to, uh, to the uh, purple wave, and when we add up these two waves, we will end up with a wave that's actually smaller, and considerably smaller, has smaller amplitude, this wave, than the purple wave had. We can see it in the plot as well. So we can see that in this case, we see a difference in, in between the purple wave and the, and the black wave, whereas in this case, we see bare difference in the amplitude, only in the face, and here we can see again a positive change in the amplitude of the bigger wave, of the, of the wave of the higher amplitude. Now, this is important that what we described here is true for waves where we have considered a larger amplitude of one wave than the other wave. Now, also we have to uh, be, sh uh, be sure about that when a wave propagates uh, through the space, it changes its uh, phase. So uh, this wave propagated distance of 4 lambda, it started in 0 and then ended up in 0 as well. But if it will propagate by a 4.5 lambda, we will see that it propagated by a half of the wavelength and uh, yeah, by a half of the wavelength, uh, still it has ended up in 0. We can, however, propagate uh, in uh, uh, for, for a quarter wavelength, and we will end up at the maximum of the function. So, uh, what we have here is a phase shift of 2 pi, a phase shift of pi, a phase shift of half pi. Well, we can see that actually the distance, when we have a n times lambda distance, we will have a phase shift of 2 pi or 0. When we will have an additional uh, phase shift of one fourth of the wavelength, and then we will have a pi half phase shift, when we have half of the wavelength plus, we will have a pi phase shift, and when we will uh, have a three quarters of the length of the lambda, 
plus uh, uh, distance, we will have a three, three and a half pi phase shift. As well as it's important to see that when we have a non-scattered electrons here and the scattered electrons here, the scattered electrons actually traveled an extra distance. So you can see that these electrons traveled a shorter distance, whereas these electrons traveled a longer distance. Now, this will be very important for us to show how actually the phase contrast is formed in the microscope and what is the contrast function, the <coughs> contrast transfer function. At first, we need to know that the det detectors are detecting only uh, amplitudes, not phases. This is a problem of X-ray crystallography as well. What we can only uh, detect is the amplitude or relatively if the amplitude is higher or smaller. When an X-ray or uh, an electron is scattered by the sample, the scattering itself by the point of scattering, by the moment of scattering, is immediately changing the phase of the uh, scattered wave by pi half. This uh, we won't go into the detail because we don't ha have time for it. We just consider this as a fact that when scattering occurs, the scattered uh, beam or scattered electron will have a phase shift of uh, pi half. Then uh, uh, we have an undifracted beam, which is actual, uh, uh, actually non-scattered electrons. And uh, we can sum up the intensity of undifracted and diffracted beam. Uh, now the beam that is undifracted is the major component in the image. This will be the so-called our DC component. And the diffracted beams will just slightly add up to this uh, component. And the way if uh, it, these diffracted beams are increasing, we will get a positive uh, contrast. If it's decreasing, we will get a negative contrast. So the contrast is the relative difference uh, of the intensity at a certain point, at a certain frequency, spatial frequency, when uh, you combine your scattered and unscattered beam. Now, uh, let's take a, a look on this uh, electron that's hitting the sample, and there's a major part of unscattered electrons. This part of unscattered electrons have uh, virtually no phase shift at all. Now, let's take a look on a, uh, on a scattered electron that was scattered at a certain angle. At, this is some medium resolution scattering. And this scattering actually adds an extra part for the electron. This extra part, let's say, has a lambda, uh, one fourth of lambda hanged. So if we have a part of this as n times of lambda, this will be n times of lambda plus lambda uh, fourth. Now we know that we have a pi half phase shift of the electron because of the scattering introduced. And there's a pi half, pi half here, you can see, introduced by the extra length that the electrons had to go. And because of this, we know that uh, we see that the final vector, what we will get, it will be a little bit smaller than the vector of the unscattered electrons was. So, and this is the smallest that we can get. So this we can plot out on a plot that's uh, showing you the minimum contrast, the maximum contrast, zero contrast, uh, uh, and it's a function of spatial frequency as a point at minus one. We will take another wave. This wave will have a higher scattering angle, therefore it will uh, travel an even longer distance. And because of this longer distance, it adds up by a uh, distance of lambda half. And the lambda half is adding a pi phase shift to our electrons. And they, of course, has this extra phase shift of the uh, introduced by the scattering itself. So uh, we will have one and a half lambda, uh, one and a half pi uh, phase shift, which will end up in a wave that's uh, final uh, length, uh, final amplitude will be very similar to the unscattered one. We can see that the unscattered, uh, the scattered and the, uh, the sum of the scattered and unscattered and the unscattered amplitude is essentially the same. So we have no change. There is no change in the contrast. 
this we can plot out as a zero contrast on our plot. And of course, the spatial frequency is higher because we have a ray that, that was uh, diffracting at a larger angle. Let's take another wave. This will have even higher scattering angle, even longer distance to travel. This will have, this is a special case that we have chosen arbitrary that it will three quarters of lambda. We will see the three quarters of lambda, the, uh, it's uh, uh, three and a half pi plus the half pi caused by the scattering. That's uh, 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 two pi, uh, three and a half and half, uh, uh, yeah, two pi. A two pi is a first a full circle. And uh, actually what you are uh, doing here is that you adding the amplitude of your diffracted wave to the undiffracted one and you get a positive contrast. Now, you have to know that the undiffracted beam is really extremely strong and these diffracted beams are in comparison with the undiffracted one very weak. Therefore, we can approximate this, uh, this stuff what we have seen here. Well, we will take one more beam this beam was diffracted at a very, very low angle. It's almost the same as the undiffracted beam, but still is diffracted a little bit. So there is actually no difference in the, uh, in the length that it traveled, in the path that it traveled. So we will have no phase shift introduced by the extra distance, but we will have a phase shift introduced by the scattering itself. And this will uh, create us a final wave of an amplitude that's amplitude is very similar to the wave that actually is unscattered. So this we can plot at the very beginning of our plot as a zero again. Now, if we would go around and around and, and try all the possibilities of the waves, we would end up with a plot like this. This plot is called the contrast transfer function. The contrast transfer function says that what, with what efficiency you are transferring the contrast by a certain spatial frequency of the electrons. You can have a negative contrast at a certain frequency, you can have no contrast at all, here is no information transferred, and you can have a positive contrast. Now in reality the contrast transfer function uh, looks uh, not an exactly like a sine wave, however it's, it's a kind of sine wave, uh, but uh, it's a wave uh, that has actually many parameters. Uh, one of the parameters is the wavelength of the electron, so a contrast transfer function of a 200 kilovolt microscope will differ from a contrast transfer function of 300 uh, kilovolt uh, electron microscope because the wavelength of the electrons differs. It's also a function of the spherical aberration. Uh, this is the property of the lens of the microscope, and it's uh, more or less uh, a number that's measured by the uh, manufacturer of the microscope. Furthermore, uh, we know uh, already that it's a function of the spatial frequency because uh, we already shown these uh, electrons that are scattered more or less are uh, adding up in the uh, contrast transfer function. So this is here the k value, the spatial frequency. But one more, in, more interesting part is that it is dependent on the defocus. So if we plot out the contrast transfer function of an image that is in focus, is in an under focus of, uh, let's say you see here, one and a half micron, two microns, two and a half microns, you will have a different contrast transfer function. This is because when uh, you do a, apply defocus, you actually change the image plane. You change the image plane that is out of focus, and when you are under focus, you are bringing it closer to your sample. What happens that all these, uh, uh, all these paths that the electrons were traveling are getting shorter, but uh, as well as the, uh, the amount of the path will depend uh, on, the, on the amount of defocus that you uh, applied. Therefore, what we constructed before uh, on the previous slide, how a contrast transfer function looked like, then all these would be shifted uh, in case when we have a defocus applied. Now, uh, uh, what the contrast function, transfer function does in the electron microscope is one property that is uh, universally true for all, all electron microscopes. In focus images of uh, a sample 
in electron microscopes suffers from low contrast. This you can see here, why is it so? So when you have an uh, in-focus image in the electron microscope, you can barely see it. The contrast is really miserable and the contrast will increase when you apply a slight amount of defocus or a higher amount of defocus. The reason for that is that a contrast tensor function of an in-focus image is shown on the left and you can see that for a large area of spatial frequencies, it is almost zero. It's very close to zero. You have a 0 0.1 uh, contrast transferred in the low uh, spatial frequencies. The low spatial frequencies are describing large, large, large features. So if, for example, we have virus particles, then we won't see these virus particles. Actually, what we would see would be some fine details, but uh, in the electron microscope, these fine details are as well uh, noise. So virtually what you would see at the, uh, at the zero focus is more like noise and almost no features of uh, visible uh, particles. What will happen when you apply a bit of defocus is that uh, this range, what we have is 0 0.1 here, we had here, at this range our contrast transfer function has considerably larger values, negative values, but large values. This means that here the contrast is transferred by the electrons even in at low spatial frequencies. That means that the particles or, uh, that you are looking for would be visible in the microscope. Now, how a contrast transfer function looks in the microscope, this is what I told you about the particles. You have a very slightly defocused particles by minus one micron. You can barely see the particles. And if you take the image of the same particles at minus 2.7 micron, you can clearly see the particles. They are there. This uh, implies that it would be beneficial to take images of the particles at high defocus. However, this is not the true. We will uh, uh, tell later why is it so. Here you can see the contrast transfer function. This is actually a carbon film that we take a Fourier transform of the carbon film and we can see in the reciprocal space that in the reciprocal space actually we have spaces where there is no and there are no amplitudes. There are black dark spaces. If there are no amplitudes, there is information loss. There, there are frequencies that actually have zero amplitudes. And this is because that actually at the same place uh, of the contrast transfer function, uh, there are these zero nodes, which are actually influencing our image. Now you can see that this contrast transfer function looks a little bit different from the contrast transfer function that we uh, described before. Therefore, I will show you why is it so. The contrast transfer function itself is not uh, just an infinitely oscillating wave that varies from minus one to plus one, but this function has a so-called envelope function. The envelope function, uh, what envelope function does is it dampens the high frequencies. The envelope function looks something like this. Uh, it passes the high frequencies with a very uh, decent uh, amplitude. However, when you are getting higher and higher, you are decreasing the amplitude of the transfer. The reason for this uh, uh, is because of the chromatic aberrations, because the instabilities of the microscope, the focus spread, the energy spread of the electron beam that we told about. This is the reason why we actually need a field emission gun. The energy spread of, uh, of a tungsten filament would be so high that actually this envelope function would diminish all these uh, components from a certain uh, frequency and we would be not able to reconstruct high resolution images, no matter how good detector we would have. Uh, another thing that's uh, uh, influencing this, uh, uh, this envelope function is the defocus. The higher the defocus, the more we are dampening, we are lowering the high frequencies. And this is the reason why we actually don't want to acquire our uh, data set at high defocus. We want to choose a defocus where we still can find our particles and uh, we have a, a, a decent amount of high resolution information. Actually, when you are acquiring your data set, 
you are acquiring it at a varying uh, diffosi and there are other reasons for that we will discuss it later now the very last part that we are going to talk about <clears throat> we have some extra minutes to uh, uh, to spend is the point spread function now uh, point spread function is uh, not only electron microscopy point spread function uh, uh, also uh, occurs in uh, optical microscopy the point spread function is a function that actually spreads a point across some area in the detector so uh, the best thing uh, what we would have is to have a, uh, a microscope that would transfer an object when we have, would have a delta function a delta function is infinitely thin and has some some height we would have a delta function of the object and by the microscope we, we would make an image of this delta function and that would be a delta function this would be the perfect microscope this is however not the case this is not the case there are many reasons for that and one of the reasons will be the contrast transfer function as well uh, however in uh, in optical microscopy in electron microscopy all the images all uh, the single points in the image are affected by the point spread function and actually it's a convolution of the point spread function and what this convolution does is that uh, it spreads this point somehow over the detector so actually our object had a single thin feature whereas our image has a feature that is spread by the point spread function we can see this in uh, electron microscopy as well this is an image here of a gold bead a gold bead is a 5 or 10 nanometer gold and uh, a gold bead actually itself in, uh, is electron non-transparent therefore an image of a gold bead should be a black dot a black dot with sharp edges what you have here is a, a gray dot or a black dot in the middle which is getting uh, turning grayish to the uh, to the sides as well as it's not sharp and you can see some halo effect and some fringes you know some fringes around this black dot this is caused by the point spread function that actually uh, uh, actually convoluted our uh, object to the image so what we can say that the image is actually the image of the object convoluted by the point spread function in electron microscopy it turned out that the point spread function actually is the Fourier transform of the contrast transfer function and this is very important so what we get here is would be a contrast transfer function and it would oscillate like this and if we would apply this contrast transfer function to our uh, delta function it would end up in something like this so every point on our image is spread over the imaging plane into multiple pixels and there is this kind of, uh, of rim and the halo effect now our goal is to somehow recover the image of the original object so uh, what we have we have a fuzzy uh, image uh, of the object because what we got is uh, the convolution of the Fourier transform the contrast transfer function with the object I hope this is uh, a kind of clear uh, if you take a look how a 2d point spread function would look like this is uh, an image of the point spread function this is actually not not from the electron microscope but here it would look like uh, similar yet a little bit different this is from optical microscopy where you see that if we convolute our delta function with this point spread function we will get a kind of peak that has some waviness around and now you have to think about that you are convolving 
every single pixel, every single uh, place in your image with this function. So your image actually is getting distorted and you want to recover the original of this image. How you can do it? Well, if we stated that actually the image is the convolution of the original object that we Im uh, imaged with the point spread function, then by the convolution theorem, and this is very important, we talked about the convolution theorem in the Fourier uh, transform part of this lecture, states that then actually the Fourier transform of the image is a multiplication of the Fourier transform of the object with the point spread function, Fourier transform of the point spread function of the uh, microscope. And we know that the Fourier transform, we know it from here, here we know that the point spread function is a Fourier transform of CTF, whereas the CTF is then the Fourier transform of the point spread function, then we know that the Fourier transform of the point spread function is actually the contrast transfer function. So what we got when we are doing some imaging is that we have a Fourier transform of our object. This is uh, actually an image at the back focal plane where we told that in the microscope at the back focal plane we have the Fourier transform of our object and in this back focal plane it's actually getting multiplied by the CTF of the microscope. And then it's making an inverse Fourier transform on the image plane where it creates a real space image. Now, a very easy way how to deconvolve this image would be just uh, to see that the original object looked like, actually, from this equation, that the original object's Fourier transform is actually the Fourier transform of the image divided by the contrast transfer function. And if we want to see the real space of this object, how it was really look like before the, uh, before the image or the application of the contrast transfer function or the point spread function, then we simply do a, a inverse Fourier transform of this uh, division. Now, let's take a look how this look like. This is an object of a ribosome. This is a simulated uh, data uh, using SPIDER program. And what we do in the real space, we convolute it with the point spread function of, uh, of a microscope at a certain defocus. You can see that we have a very nice clear image at the beginning, and then we have some kind of fuzzy image because this image is convol convolved by the point spread function of the microscope which is the Fourier transform of the CTF we already talked about. So not, what we are going to do now is that we will make a Fourier transform of this image. We will have a Fourier a recipro in reciprocal space, uh, the phases and the uh, power spectrum, and then we divide this power spectrum using the CTF. So actually, in the CTF, uh, in the power spectrum, we take one of the amplitudes at, let's say, an uh, H1, K1, and we know that this is, uh, let's say, H1, K0, it will be easier, H1, K0, and we take a look on the contrast transfer function, what is the value at uh, H1, K0, and we divide that value with the value of the uh, contrast transfer function at this uh, point. Where we will pass through the image, we will find somewhere here that we have an H200 uh, K0. We will take a look what is H200 here, and we will divide uh, the amplitude by that value of the contrast transfer function. Now, uh, here you will need to think about the contrast transfer function as it's not a 1D wave, but actually it's a rotational wave. It's, it's like if I would take this wave and rotationally turn it around, uh, in the Fourier space, so then you can more easily think about how this multiplication look like, or uh, actually here's a division. And when we divide, we will get another reciprocal space image, which is actually the division of the uh, Fourier transform of the image 
with the CTF. And what we do now, we just do an inverse Fourier transform and we get the image of our ribosome, which is more or less very similar to what the original object looked like. It's never the same. There are some loss and, uh, and loses. And what we lose here, we lose these points where actually the point spread function or the CTF is uh, zero. Where the CTF is zero, there no contrast is transferred, no information is transferred into the image. Therefore, at this place, we have no way how to recover any information, as well as we cannot divide by zero. We all know from maths. So uh, these, at these places where the CTF is zero, we have to omit uh, the division with the CTF. There are other ways how to do the, the CTF correction, but this is the most easy to understand for, uh, for explanation. Now, for this, uh, I will, it will take less than five minutes, so I will finish this. Uh, estimation of the CTF. Uh, to be able to do the contrast transfer function correction, we actually need to know what the contrast transfer function is. We told that the contrast transfer function is actually a property of the microscope, uh, is a property of the microscope lens, as well as it's a property of the defocus. And now if you think that uh, you come to a microscope, take uh, some sample, bring it in focus that has a zero defocus, and then just turn the knob to ha apply a minus uh, 2.5 microns defocus and you take an image and you think that actually this image has a minus 2.5 defocus and we already know the contrast transfer function for this image, this is not really true. So uh, this is not that precise. So what you uh, cannot rely on is that what you set on the microscope is actually the property of the image. Nevertheless, we already know that in the Fourier transform of the image, we can clearly see the zones of zeros where actually there is no information, where actually the amplitudes are missing because they are zero. So we know in this uh, Fourier space that actually if we can find a wave of the CTF that will cross our uh, zeros here, uh, and we can simulate this kind of CTF, then we can find the exact defocus of our image. And this is what we are doing during the defocus estimation. We give the program a rough estimate that our estimate of the defocus is around two and a half microns, and the program actually starts to uh, simulate CTF functions around two and a half micron defocus and compare it, compare the zeros of this uh, contrast transfer function the oscillation of the zeros with the oscillation of the zeros of your uh, Fourier transformed image. So this is the way how you can very precisely estimate the contrast transfer function and then use these uh, values of the contrast transfer function for the CTF correction. Now, this is the end of the lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. What we learned in this, vector, uh, in this lecture uh, we learned a lot of about spatial waves, that we have spatial waves in one dimension, two dimension, three dimensions. We have Fourier transform of the spatial waves, how the Fourier uh, space look like, how the reciprocal space look like. We know what is inverse Fourier transform. We know uh, all the properties or many of the properties of the reciprocal space. Then we elaborated a little bit about the image formation in uh, transmission electron microscope and the contrast transfer function and the properties of the contrast transfer function and how it affects the point spread function and how we can correct for the spread of the point spread function. So, uh, as I promised you, uh, I, I tell you some interesting thing about LENA, why LENA is uh, one of the models of uh, the image processing. This is LENA in 1972. <clears throat> this is LENA the last year. This is an actual uh, micro, uh, sorry, photograph, uh, which is not uh, coming out from this one. They just tried to make it similar. And you can see that Lena is actually 69 years old now. Uh, this image of Lena was uh, the first digitized image that uh, 
per, that served uh, for the development of the JPEG format. And from that time, all the other persons who were doing some image processing and uh, image analysis, uh, they take this image, this digitized image, as uh, the sample where they show the properties of their programs. So actually, Lena is a living person. She is a Swedish person and so far she, is, she is, has a good health. Um, Please feel free to ask any question. We have, we are over time eight minutes, so hope you are still awake. But anyway, if there are some questions, feel free to ask. Dots, depending on frequency, end up uh, closer or farther from the center in Fourier space. Yes. Does it mean that scattering angle depends on the frequency? Uh, scattering angle depends on 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 the frequency, but uh, actually the frequency uh, of the wave is constant. So if you go back to the Bragg's law, there's the lambda uh, of the radiation, and uh, this is the lambda of the X-ray or the lambda of the uh, electrons. But actually, the uh, the incident electrons that are scattered, they all have the same lambda, the same frequency, and we are uh, we have the constant. Uh, um, uh, it is constant all, all the time. So actually, the angle of scattering in this case is not dependent uh, on, on the frequency, it's, uh, because the frequency is the same. It will depend only on uh, which scattering centers it was scattered on. If it uh, has a very dense amount of scattering centers or very dense Bragg planes, then it's scattering at a higher angle when the, the brake planes are of less, uh, they are less condensed, uh, then it carries a lower resolution information and it's scattered at a lower angle. I hope it was clear this way. Mm. So uh, what you uh, will need to think about that uh, here are two frequencies. One is the frequency of the electron that we are imaging with yeah. that corresponds to the wavelength of the electron and there is a spatial frequency of the image that corresponds to the wavelength of the uh, of the wave in the image. So these are two distinct uh, things, and some sometimes the people are mixing it up, and and they are not uh, aware of what frequency we are talking about. So maybe I was not aware of which frequency you you thought about. Yeah, yeah. So like my question was about uh, the that wave that uh, that forms in a Fourier space. So like. Yes. When electrons are passing mm -hmm. uh, in the column, yes. uh, they at some point end up in a Fourier space, and in this Fourier space, uh, like lower frequency signal closer is closer to the center, so, and higher frequency signal. Uh -huh. Yes, this is true, but this is not the frequency of the electron. This is the frequency of the resulting image. So uh -huh. what you have here, if you go back, uh, we need to go back here. Here. Uh, Okay, so here you have a dot. You, you are you are talking about this dot, and yeah, you are yeah. interested in the frequency. Actually, the frequency of the electron that is coming from here and is getting scattered remains the same. The frequency of the electron is not changing at all. There is only a scattering angle, so the electrons are scattered at an angle, and then they combine in this spot. But the uh, the frequency of this spot is uh, mean the the distance from the center of the image of the unscattered electron, let's say, yeah? So the further this spot is, is from the center, then it has, this spot has a spatial frequency. It's not the, uh, not the frequency of the electron, but the frequency of uh, the amplitude in the Fourier space. This is the HK value, actually, in the Fourier mm -hmm. space uh, that's representing this spot. So that frequency is the frequency of the image not the frequency of the electron. Is that clear now? Yeah, that, that, that's clear now. So huh? like um, this, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Uh, hi, this is Katarina. I was just wondering if you are going to 
um, upload the presentation to the information system. Yes, yes. The the presentations will be in the information system. Uh, they will be uh, in a, a format of PDF, so the animations won't be there, but definitely I'm going to upload these presentations. And hopefully I will upload also the recorded uh, lecture. Uh, I will try to find a way how to do that. Actually, in the Teams now, I, I don't have an option to record it, but uh, uh, I have a different way how to do that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Some other questions? Okay, so this is the end of the lecture. Uh, as I told you, the next time, uh, this was the last lecture uh, by me. I hope you enjoyed the lectures by me. I hope these lectures were understandable. Uh, all the information in the lectures is very condensed. Uh, this is uh, also the reason why, why I am giving you the study materials of this presentation, uh, as well as we'll try to upload the lecture, the recording of the lecture as well. Uh, so that you can uh, pass through and try to better understand what I was talking about if you were not able to catch up with the speed because there were lots of things that we needed to uh, to do in this lecture and I hope that uh, it was as much clear as possible. <laughs>